How good it is to be in the house of the Lord uh, this morning. How good it is. How good it is to see each and every one of you here. Easter is my most favorite time of the year. I love to see all the people. I love to see the little children. Uh, I love to, to uh, see the, the new little Easter dresses and, and the Easter clothes. I just love Easter. I love to, I love to uh, see all the people who have come to hear the Easter message. Uh, the message of hope that Easter provides for us. I believe that uh, uh, the human spirit thrives and survives off of the Easter message of hope. We need it. We have to come and receive it. For all of us who are believers, uh, it is our strength. It is our foundation, if you will. With everything that's going on in our world and, and possibly in our individual lives, we need to hear the Easter story. We need to hear it again and again. You know, it's a, it's a story that hasn't changed in 2,000 years, but it's a story that changes people every day as they hear it, as they relate to it, as they experience it. As we look at our Easter text this morning from John 20, I want you to notice that John makes it very clear that it is still dark. There is a, a dualism uh, in this fourth gospel between light and darkness that is scattered all throughout John's text. Uh, for John, light is uh, a representation of, of what is good, what is holy, what is acceptable in the sight of God. But darkness represents evil, ignorance, those things that are compatible with the dark and fallen world. And there's a constant battle going on in John's Gospel between the two. So think of that as we look at our text this morning. John 20, verses 1 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciples outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying. One at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. He said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Early, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, the writer said, the darkness of the cross, the darkness of the crucifixion, still lingers in the shadows in our text. I have been to the tomb of Jesus outside Old City Jerusalem. And you can see uh, Golgotha from the tomb, the place, the place of the skull. In fact, you could throw a rock easily from the tomb of Jesus and hit the place of the skull, the place where Jesus was crucified. It is still in this darkness that John describes for us, this early morning darkness, but also the darkness of the cross. That Mary Magdalene, our main character in our story this morning, had, who has set out to go to the tomb. Now we find in, in Luke's gospel that Mary is a Galilean woman from whom Jesus has uh, exercised uh, seven demons from her. We're not told what form these demons may have presented themselves uh, for Mary, only that ever since she met Jesus, they have not had a hold on her life. If you have ever been delivered from something that has had a hold on your life, then you know, then you understand why Mary Magdalene was so eager to get to the tomb uh, in the wee hour morning on this day. <coughs> the morning of darkness that still lingered. We find in the text that when she got to the tomb, she noticed that the stone, a heavy stone, one not easily moved, was moved. And she didn't uh, look inside. She didn't go inside to investigate, but immediately assumed that someone had stolen the body. Mary's actions represent what she knows, what she's used to. What she knows and understands is that a world without Jesus is a dark place, is an evil place, is a lonely place. She watched from the foot of the cross as they crucified her Lord. For Mary, all hope was lost. So when she saw that the stone had been removed, she immediately ran to tell Simon Peter and the other, and the other disciple of the news. And that's where we, we move to the other two characters in our story this morning, at God's Easter story. Simon Peter, who is the leader of the disciples, uh, one who was an ex-fisherman uh, and business owner, one who always seems to have good intentions, but very rarely follows through uh, what, with what he says he will do, except for, uh, or at least up to this point, that is. There is no record of Peter being at the cross of Calvary when Jesus died. But knowing Peter, he was probably there somewhere hiding uh, in the shadow. Now in contrast to Peter, we have the other disciple, uh, who is called the disciple whom Jesus loved in our text, or, or the beloved disciple. This disciple is never named uh, in the Gospel of John but always plays the role of a model disciple. At the foot of the cross, Jesus even entrusts his mother with this disciple. There are some scholars who say that, that this is the, uh, John, the writer of the gospel, this fourth gospel. Others say that it, he's just a, a, a model disciple. 
the, the supreme disciple, the one that we should strive to become like. But after Mary's announcement, Peter and the other disciple, uh, they run to the tomb. Now, if they're in the upper room where I, I figure they are, that's almost a mile that they must run to the tomb. Now, I, I ran the 1320 in junior high. It wasn't a pretty sight. <laughs> but they run to the tomb. And the other disciple, uh, the uh, uh, model disciple, if you will, he gets there first. Of course. Of course. And he looks in, but doesn't go in. And then Peter gets there, and he, he just bursts inside. And the scripture says that Peter saw the linen wrappings lying there, the cloth uh, that had been on Jesus' head, and not lying with the linen wrappings, wrappings uh, but rolled up in a place all by itself. For Peter, that didn't mean a thing. But when the other disciple, the model disciple, entered into the tomb and saw our text says that he believed. He believed that grave robbers would not take the time to take the clothes off Jesus and, un and undress the body. And if you're familiar with the Left Behind fiction series where, where when the people are raptured up to the uh, heaven, then uh, their clothes just fall where they were, you know, and just right in place. Well, you notice that... that uh, the clothes are, are right in place when John looks inside the tomb as though Jesus has ascended or been resurrected and the clothes are left there. Therefore, the tomb's emptiness bears witness to the fact that Jesus has conquered death. Even so, the gospel writer says in verse 9 and 10 of our text that they, they still fully didn't believe or didn't understand what the scriptures said about the resurrection. And so they, they returned home. Apparently, Mary Magdalene had followed them to the tomb because she was outside the tomb weeping when they left. She now gets up enough courage to, to look inside. And when she does, she sees the angels. One at the head and one at the feet, the scripture says. And they ask her why she's weeping. Now, all through the Bible, angels represent divine things. They are agents of God. Who at some times uh, announce good news. Mary could use some good news today. Maybe you could use some good news today. I always can use good news. But in verse 13, Mary explains that her weeping is a result of the absence of her Lord. And when she turns around, she sees Jesus, but she doesn't recognize Him. And He asks the same question. Three times in just these few verses, she's asked why she is weeping. And she says because it's the absence of her Lord. She misses Jesus. She needs Jesus. A few months ago, I was watching the news and, and they were interviewing the Pope and the Pope mentioned that our world today has spiritual Alzheimer's. I never heard that term before. Spiritual all hundreds. Mary doesn't recognize her Lord. But Mary is a faithful disciple. But maybe in her grief, maybe because she what she's going through, she just cannot see what's who Jesus is. If we look at Matthew 13, verse 44 through 52, Jesus described the opposite of the kingdom of God as a place of, of outer darkness where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Surely Mary feels this way, that without the one who set her free from the bonds of evil, from the, the demons, 
whatever those might have been for her. Maybe she fears that they will return without her Savior in her life. For Mary, she is in this outer darkness that Matthew described. But to pull her from this state of mind, Jesus calls her name. In John 10, 4, Jesus says, For the sheep know the shepherd's voice and will follow him. Mary may not be able to recognize Jesus because of her grief, her current condition, but Mary knows his voice. She, said she has heard Jesus teach in John 10, 9 and say, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and he will come in and go out and find pasture. It is the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, it is I who come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. Mary has heard Jesus say in John 10, 11, that for I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. No robbers didn't come and steal the body of Jesus because Mary has heard Jesus say in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And those who believe in me will never die. And Mary has probably heard uh, Jesus talk to the disciples in John 14, 19 when he said, because I live, you shall live also. In that moment, in verse 17 of our text, Mary comes out of her spiritual Alzheimer, Alzheimer's, if, if, if that's what's taking place, her forgetfulness of, of who Jesus is in the, the moment of her grief. And she holds on to his feet, the scripture says. Jesus said, Mary, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Jesus is referring to the words he spoke to Mary and the disciples in the upper room just days before. When he spoke of his death. John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and pray, prepare a place for you, I will come again, so that where I am, you may be also. Folks, that's what the resurrection is all about. Jesus ascending to the Father and preparing a place for us. Not only a place for us when we get to heaven, but a place for us to dwell and, and, and build and, and spend a relationship with Christ in the here and now. Easter offers hope in the midst of darkness, in the midst of a dark and fallen world. Where there is darkness, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Where there is hunger and, and thirst, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And where there is death, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever believes and lives in me will never die. Whether you are like Mary and, and, and you've been delivered from from several demons, something that has had a hold on your life, or you're like Peter and, and still trying to figure all this out, or maybe you're like the model disciple, the one who Jesus loved. There is a place for each of us in this resurrection story because Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Let us pray. Amazing God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the Easter story, even though we've heard it over and over again. It's a story that keeps on living in our hearts and minds. We pray that it continues to do that and give us strength and hope. In Christ's name we pray.